The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Welcome to the RSES Manufacturer Webinar Series. I'm Bob Mater, the Managing Editor of RSES Journal, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar titled Optimized Ventilation for High-Performance Buildings, presented by James DeBerry and Joe Sheffley, both at Mitsubishi Electric Train, HVAC US. James develops and executes marketing plans for Mitsubishi Electric's commercial new product launches and existing product maintenance. With extensive corporate marketing experience, James most recently served as senior marketing manager at AT&T in Atlanta. He's a graduate of the University of Georgia with a degree in journalism. Joe provides engineering and application support for products developed with third-party manufacturers. He assists in the development of new and existing products, including dedicated outdoor air systems, or DOAS, City Multi, and other OEM products. He has worked at Mitsubishi Electric for eight years, previously serving as a mechanical engineer. Joe is a lead accredited professional and certified energy manager. He earned a bachelor's degree in physics from Union College and his MBA from Northeastern University. Before we get started, I would like to thank Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC for sponsoring today's webinar. Their generous support is how we keep webinars free for members, and we value their shared commitment to educating HVACR professionals. The presentation will last approximately 40 or 45 minutes, and afterwards, there will be a Q&A session. Please submit any questions that you have throughout the presentation using the GoToWebinar dialog box on the right-hand side of your screen. I'll send the questions to the Mitsubishi folks, and we'll answer as many of them as we have time for. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available online for viewing at your convenience as soon as possible. And now I'd like to introduce our first presenter, James DeBerry. Thank you, Bob. Good afternoon to everyone on the phone and welcome to today's Optimized Ventilation for High Performance Buildings webinar. On behalf of Joe Sheffley and the entire Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US organization, I'd like to thank you for the time you've chosen to invest in today's session and believe you'll find the content presented to be quite valuable. We're planning to spend, as Bob mentioned, the next 40 to 45 minutes discussing building ventilation, including the different styles and associated benefits and challenges, alongside how ventilation systems interact with variable refrigerant flow or VRF systems. The learning objectives of today's webinar include Identify current industry trends driving specialized ventilation adoption. Understanding the benefits and applications of energy recovery ventilators and dedicated outdoor air systems. Examine the efficiencies of VRF technology. Understand how high efficient ventilation complements VRF systems for high performance design. Joe and I look forward to sharing our thoughts on ventilation and the HVAC industry, along with a look at three successful projects and resources for continued learning this afternoon. I'm sure the topic will stir up plenty of questions given the wide range of ventilation styles that exist in today's marketplace. Joe and I have reserved time at the end of the, today's webinar to address as many of the quest those questions as possible. So as Bob mentioned, be sure to submit your questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A function within the presentation interface. HVAC systems, along with associated ventilation systems, can complicate the design or layout of a building. However, options exist to avoid that complication. We'll get into more detail during the presentation and present options that you can use when designing the optimal HVAC and ventilation systems for your applications. Let's start out by talking about the changing needs of commercial buildings throughout the United States. First, the population of our country continues to grow overall while certain regions of the country grow at faster rates than others. 
The growing number of baby boomers that are reaching retirement age is, a dri is driving a population boom in warmer climates such as Florida, Nevada, Texas, and the Carolinas. In addition, the economic pressures that our nation has seen over the last decade have forced younger families in Generation X to move to locations where jobs are plentiful. This has driven demand for affordable housing, schools, office buildings, and other retail establishments, all of which require ventilation systems in some way, shape, or form. Second, the rise of multifamily functional spaces has driven the need for flexibility in design. Buildings are no longer built with one purpose in mind. They may have multiple purposes over the course of a single day. Examples of this could be include co-working spaces or buildings that incorporate a mix of retail and dining on the first few floors and apartment or condos on the higher floors. In fact, the ability of a building to serve multiple purposes may even lead to the owner earning higher rents in the future. Lastly, the integration of smart technologies continues. Building occupants who have become accustomed to living in the information at your fingertips era are now seeking ways to personalize their comfort within an occupied space. Providing the ability to personalize occupant comfort through the introduction of smart technologies such as app-based thermostats leads to happier tenants, making the building owner's job easier. Now let's dive a bit deeper into some of those trends we discussed and introduce a few new ones. A little earlier, we discussed the shifts in population that are occurring across the United States. These changes have led to the construction of facilities that support the changing population, such as an increase in senior living facilities and hospitals across the Southern United States. As it relates to ventilation systems, facilities such as the ones just described require specialized ventilation systems, which are regulated by state and local codes developed from ASHRAE 62.1 and the International Mechanical Code. As ventilation systems become more regulated, building owners are increasingly understanding the importance of indoor air quality. The bottom line related to ventilation is that a greater awareness of indoor air quality and its effects on wellness is making commercial building owners and occupants demand solutions that introduce fresher air into a building. According to the California Public Utilities Commission in a 2018 statement, quote, the need for better performing HVAC systems will only increase as high performance buildings become more prevalent due to ambitious sustainability goals set by private entities and state and local governments. The rise in high performance buildings and their associated certifications such as LEED, Green Globes, Passive House, and more requires more efficient ventilation systems to be applied. Tighter building envelopes also require more sophisticated ventilation systems specifically related to the area of occupant safety. The tighter the building envelope, the less indoor air can escape, potentially trapping harmful pollutants and chemicals indoors should a catastrophic incident occur. The demand for space-saving flexible equipment has a direct correlation to the increasing demand for architecturally pleasing building designs. As building design becomes increasingly focused on style versus function, there is a demand for mechanical systems that are flexible enough to adapt based on those designs. These space-saving elements, such as the ability to decouple the ventilation and HVAC systems, enable the architect to design around the building owner's vision while not impacting the engineering community whose core responsibility lies in designing the optimal mechanical system to achieve the building's conditioning requirements. The demand for energy efficient mechanical equipment has been and continues to be a major influencer within the HVAC industry. With energy and other utility rates constantly fluctuating, your clients are looking to invest in efficient technology whether through government regulation, sustainability concerns, market-based utility incentives, or the desire to gain market share, the HVAC industry's key players have been ratcheting up efficiencies over the last several years. Looking to the future, this is a trend that will continue to be at the forefront of product development for years to come.
There is also a demand for better control over mechanical systems within a building. Control over the, those systems comes at two levels, centralized and locally within the space. Centralized controllers can range from building automation systems that control all mechanical equipment within the building to controllers that control all aspects of one mechanical system, such as the HVAC system. Controllers within the space, including those that integrate smart technologies, provide occupants the ability to personalize their comfort within that space. Demand for both types of control, centralized and local, continues to rise within the HVAC industry. Now that we've taken a look at trends occurring in the HVAC industry and ventilation industries, let's briefly explore variable refrigerant flow, or, or simply BRF technology. Variable refrigerant flow technology was introduced in the United States in 2003 after many decades of prominence throughout the rest of the world. In fact, in Europe, BRF, BRF systems account for over 65% of the HVAC market. Instead of moving conditioned air through ductwork to the space requiring conditioning, BRF delivers conditioned refrigerant directly to that space, eliminating the requirement for long runs of ductwork and the inefficiencies of moving conditioned air through that ductwork. In addition, VRF provides the ultimate personalized comfort experience for a building's occupants. Each space or zone requiring conditioning will have their own network of indoor units. This network of indoor units is controlled from within the space, providing the occupant with the ability to personalize their comfort. Some systems can even cool some areas of a building while heating others from the same system. They're able to provide essentially simultaneous heating and cooling. This leads to happier tenants and fewer comfort control complaints for building owners and facility managers. Finally, due to, due to the design flexibility of BRF, it can be applied to a variety of building types and applications. From adding capacity to an, to an already taxed HVAC system on a college campus, to providing K-12 schools with a quiet, efficient way to cool classrooms, to even conditioning a high-rise new construction project, VRF is the optimal HVAC choice. The bottom line is that the efficiency of the systems, coupled with their ability to provide personalized comfort and ease of application into virtually any commercial building, has led to a rapidly increasing VRF adoption rate among, among HVAC specifiers. Now that we've discussed an overview of today's webinar, along with a brief look at VRF technology and a few trends within the HVAC and ventilation industries, we're ready to begin the ventilation-specific portion discussion of our webinar today. I'll now turn the presentation over to Joe Sheffley, Senior Manager of Applications for Mitsubishi Electric Train, HVAC US, to dive deeper into the world of ventilation. Joe? Thank you, James. So, why do we ventilate buildings? Well, for one, it's required by code. Secondly, ventilation improves indoor air quality and is necessary for occupant safety as building construction gets tighter and tighter. And lastly, efficiency. While historically, ventilation was a matter of necessity to ensure occupant safety, there is currently a trend toward bringing efficiency to this sector of the HVAC market. Unlike heating and cooling systems, which are regulated by energy code, whose main focus is efficiency and occupant comfort, ventilation systems are regulated by mechanical code, whose primary purpose is occupant safety. For commercial buildings in the US, ventilation code is typically based on either ASHRAE 62.1 or International Mechanical Code, IMC. State and local jurisdictions adopt these standards as code, but sometimes make small changes or adjustments to the language and requirements. Both of these standards have similar calculations to determine the amount of ventilation required for a given building. 
Uh, let's discuss energy recovery ventilators and dedicated outside air systems. Energy recovery ventilators are ventilation systems that contain supply and exhaust fans in addition to an energy recovery device such as a fixed plate heat exchanger or a rotating energy wheel. ERVs typically do not contain mechanical cooling or heating. ERVs recover both sensible and latent energy and typically cover about half of the ventilation load. They also contain air filters to remove harmful pollutants and improve indoor air quality. With independently controlled supply and exhaust fans, ERVs help with a building's pressurization strategy. Most buildings design targets, <clears throat> design targets neutral pressurization or slightly positive pressurization to keep contaminants out. Because ERVs recover both sensible and latent energy, they aid in bringing ventilation air closer to room neutral conditions. Looking at a psychometric chart, you can see that ERVs reduce the variability of the incoming ventilation air and bring it closer to the desired conditions for occupant comfort. For a given amount of ventilation air to be processed, the ERV again will handle approximately half of the load to bring it to room neutral conditions. In other words, a ventilation system not utilizing energy recovery will generally require double the tonnage of mechanical cooling and heating. Dedicated outside air systems are capable of bringing 100% raw, untreated outside air all the way to room neutral conditions by cooling that air below the dew point and then reheating it to 70 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. SOAS systems contain energy recovery approximately 60% of the time, and they come in both packaged and split system varieties. Although packaged DOAS systems are more common in the market by about a factor of 10 to 1. In recent years, variable speed inverter compressors have made their way into dedicated outside air systems, which has helped improve performance and efficiency. There are, they, these are the same style of inverter scroll compressors found in VRF systems. Older mechanical design technology utilizes a single rooftop unit to condition both the ventilation air and the space cooling and heating. The problem with this is that it, it compromises have to be made and it is difficult to perform both functions equally well. More modern mechanical designs utilize DOAS systems for the ventilation and another technology type for the space conditioning, such as VRF, water source heat pump, or hydronic fan coils. The one caveat here is that decoupled ventilation designs have a higher price point than packaged rooftop designs. Now let's look at some design considerations. Ventilation air from a dedicated outside air system, or ERV, can be ducted to the back of the VRF fan coils. However, this design makes air balancing in the field more challenging, given the variable speed fans in the DOAS or ERV in addition to the variable speed fans in the coils, in the fan coils. Personally, I prefer completely decoupled ventilation designs where the ventilation air utilizes a separate parallel duct path, which facilitates fan balancing and ASHRAE 62.1 compliance. Again, the caveat here is cost. Two duct systems cost more than one. Let's look at the refrigerant flow of a standard cooling only application where you've got a condensing unit connected to an air handler in a split configuration. And then the next slide, we'll look at a unique new way that ventilation air is being processed in a split system configuration. So here we have a full column of subcooled liquid leaving the condensing unit and bypassing the reheat coil, can pretend it's not there. It, that full column of liquid enters the evaporator coil where hot summer air crosses that coil, boiling that cold liquid refrigerant off into a low pressure gas where it then returns to the condensing unit to be pumped up once again. This is just standard refrigeration, how any split system works. Now let's look at that same system, but we're gonna add reheat this time 
And instead of doing a full column of subcooled liquid from the condensing unit, we're only going to partially condense and we're going to send a mixed phase refrigerant out to the air handler. When it gets to the air handler, all of that mixed phase refrigerant is going to go through the reheat coil where it continues the condensing. And so leaving the reheat coil, you've got a full column of subcooled liquid, which then enters the evaporator coil. And just as before, that hot summer air is going to evaporate that liquid in, off into a low pressure gas where it returns to the condensing unit uh, to be pumped up once again. Now, in doing so, we're basically using this reheat coil as if it were the last section of the condenser. So instead of rejecting that condenser heat to outdoor ambient, we're using it more or less for free where we want it as free reheat inside the air handler after the cooling coil to bring it back to room neutral conditions, which is 70 to 72 Fahrenheit, 50% RH. Let's talk about ventilation and efficiency. There is a growing demand in the market for energy efficient ventilation systems. And on average, a system utilizing inverter driven compressors is 25% more efficient seasonally than a system utilizing single speed scroll compressors or digital scroll compressors. Inverter driven DOAS equipment offers not only better efficiency, but lower sound, longer equipment life, and tighter control over supply air conditions as the amount of hot gas available for reheat is proportional to the system loading at a given time. Many conventional DOAS systems utilizing digital scroll compressors, they only have digital scroll compressors on the lead circuit for the most part, although some systems have it on both, um, and a single speed scroll compressor on the second circuit. And the result of having one digital scroll and one single speed scroll is that there's a large fraction of run hours where there's little hot gas available for reheat. And so the system isn't capable of making room neutral air during those run hours. In an effort to bring energy efficiency to the ventilation market, AHRI 920, standard 920 has been drafted and published just this year, just last month actually. Manufacturers will now begin to test to this standard and publish equipment efficiencies in the directory. This will also bring third-party verification <clears throat> to the performance and efficiency of the ventilation market. And the two new metrics that have been introduced via AHRI standard 920 are MRE for moisture removal efficiency. This is like a full load performance like an EER. And there's ISMRE, which is integrated seasonal moisture removal efficiency. And this is your seasonal performance, kind of like SEER um, or IEER. Let's talk about some applications. So how much do we ventilate? The amount of ventilation necessary for a particular building or application is based upon the occupancy type for the building along with the size of the building. There is a wide range from zero need for ventilation in some applications, such as multifamily residential, where operable windows can sometimes be used to meet the ventilation requirement, all the way up to extreme ventilation requirements for industrial applications, such as manufacturing. The focus of this presentation is commercial buildings, sometimes referred to as comfort cooling applications. Oftentimes in residential applications, the VRF fan coils are used to treat ventilation. However, you will want to limit the amount of raw untreated outside air in order to avoid issues with humidity. Office buildings typically only require a blended ventilation rate of around 0.15 CFM per square foot. While school applications may require a blended ventilation rate of 0.3 CFM per square foot or more. The varying occupant densities in different building types has an impact on the, on the type of ventilation equipment that is commonly used in these applications. ERVs are common in office buildings, while dedicated outside air systems are more prevalent in school applications. According to a 2006 ASHRAE journal study, on the effects of HVAC on student performance, increasing the ventilation rate from 7.5 CFM to 15 CFM per, per
person per student led to an 8% increase in academic performance. In addition to occupant density, humidity also increases the need for having a full-blown dedicated outside air system in lieu of an ERV. It is common to see East Coast applications from Maine to Florida to Texas utilizing dedicated outside air systems. However, many West Coast applications use ERVs because the cost benefit is better and they don't have the same kind of humidity concerns as the East Coast does. Lastly, when in need of guidance in selecting ventilation equipment, the ASHRAE climate zone map shown here can be extremely helpful. Back to you, James. All right, thank you very much, Joe. All right, thanks, thanks again, Joe, for that detailed explanation of ventilation systems and going into a little bit more detail on the difference between the ERVs and the DOAS systems and how they are applied in, in commercial applications. I'm sure, again, just a reminder, I'm sure the presentation will result in quite a few questions from the audience. Thank you to those who have already submitted questions. We've seen quite a few come through so far. If you still have a question, be sure to submit it using the Q&A function within the presentation interface. Joe and I look forward to addressing as many questions as possible once we conclude our prepared remarks. I did quickly want to turn our attention to a few successful applications of integrating ventilation systems alongside variable refrigerant flow technology. The first example I wanted to share is the Bank of San Antonio. Since its inception in 2007, the Bank of San Antonio has been built on strong relationships and quality service. When the bank started to grow exponentially, it needed to find a space to accommodate its growing employee as well as customer base. The bank broke ground on a new 56,000 square foot office space in 2015 and set out to find an energy efficient HVAC system that offered quality, comfort, and control. Based on those demands, alongside the desire for zone control based on the building's occup occupants' varied needs, the team selected a variable refrigerant flow system. In addition to keeping the bank's employees and customers comfortable, it also keeps the bank's technology safe and, most importantly, cool. According to Tom Marino, Executive Vice President of Operations and Technology for the bank, quote, they installed wall-hung units in the information technology office, which is essential to the operation of the organization. They can't overheat, close quote. In addition to the VRF system, the bank also installed a premises dedicated outdoor air system to the building. The DOAS provides the ability to introduce fresh air into the building while removing humidity ever present in San Antonio's climate. The combination of variable refrigerant flow and DOAS has left a positive impression on the bank's employees, providing them with a comfortable place to effectively and efficiently serve their clients. The next example, next project I wanted to share with you is, is called the Hamilton STEM Academy located in Columbus, Ohio. The Hamilton STEM Academy is a 48,000 square foot school located in Ohio's capital, Columbus, Ohio. The school recently faced a challenge. Its 70 year old HVAC system was reaching the end of its life. Faced with ever increasing energy bills, the school began to search for a more efficient HVAC and ventilation system to bring their utility bills down while adequately conditioning and providing ventilation to each classroom. Comfort conditioning and ventilation are critical to a school's school application. The presence of multiple classrooms and learning spaces, each serving a separate purpose from the other, can result in comfort control challenges. The needs of a classroom full of students fresh from gym class are vastly different than the needs of students who have been quietly learning all morning. In addition, ventilation is critical 
in this application to stop the spread of dust, dirt, debris, and viruses, all of which can be prevalent in the school. The school ultimately selected a combination of city multi-variable refrigerant flow and three rooftop DOAS systems, allowing them to accomplish their goals of reducing utility bills while not impacting the conditioning and ventilation required in each classroom. The last example I wanted to share with you today is Uber Advanced Technologies Group located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And it's housed in a two-story, 110,000 square foot building. The building mainly serves as a research and design facility for advanced technology at Uber, including self-driving automobiles. The building has a unique and challenging design in that employee offices sit side by side with car testing facilities. Those spaces produce high carbon dioxide levels, making ventilation inside the building a critical component of the overall HVAC system design. In addition, Uber's environmentally conscious culture places a focus on energy efficiency. When Uber went looking for an HVAC system for their building, ventilation management and energy efficiency were at the core of their search. The company worked with a local distributor called Comfort Supply to select a variable refrigerant flow HVAC system along with a premises dedicated outside air systems and diamond control solutions. According to Justin Kern, senior commercial sales engineer at Comfort Supply, quote, VRF was chosen for the quietness of the system. In addition, the control solution package entailed a full graphical interface for the building. We tied in the VRF systems, DOAS system, electric heaters, and exhaust fan. Close quote. This concludes the prepared portion of today's webinar. Joe and I enjoyed discussing the HVAC industry trends along with an overview of VRF technology and a few successful examples of how VRF and ventilation systems work together. We hope you found the information to be valuable and we look forward to answering your questions in just a few minutes. First, we'd like to highlight three resources among many others available for your use after this presentation concludes. These resources include our company's website, metahvac.com, metahvac.com, and links to our quarterly engineer, architect, and facility manager newsletters. In addition, we've included a link to access almost 200 case studies on our website, including those three examples that we discussed a bit earlier. On behalf of Joe and the entire Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US organization, thank you again for your time and attention this afternoon. And with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Andy, our Q&A moderator, to begin the questions and answers. Andy? Thank you, James. Thank you, Joe. All right, let's get right into it. Great presentation so far, and I think the, uh, the questions will only add to the experience. Okay, so question number one. How much does a DOAS weigh? And what kind of structural support would it need? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. I know Joe Joe is much closer to those than than I am. Obviously, those are units that go uh, outside up on the rooftop. So I'll I'll let him uh, comment on the the weight and uh, ramifications of the system on rooftops. Uh, for the most part, uh, dedicated outside air systems are in the 1,000 to 18,000 CFM range. That's that's really probably 90 plus percent of the market right there. And because of that, you know, a factor of 18 range there, it it, it varies wildly. Um, it's it's identical to asking uh, how much does a rooftop a package rooftop unit weigh, or how much does a, um, a rooftop air handler weigh. The answer is it's very similar. It's always in, in the thousands of pounds rather than hundreds, um, but it could be even even more, you know, even larger than that. It could be um, significantly larger. So there's a there's a very wide range. And so on your average building, you're gonna ha either have a roof curb installed for structural support or some steel dunnage. Okay, great. Next question, can you review when to use an ERV versus a DOAS? 
Sure. That, yeah. Another, another good question. I know in, in part of Joe's presentation, he went over, um, you know, when when to use ERVs, maybe typically more in, in office buildings versus DOAS units might be more applicable to, to schools. I'll, I'll let him, you know, comment on some of the uh, application systems he's put in with uh, his work. Yeah, thanks, James. So kind of expanding on that right there, um, it really comes down to the humidity levels and occupant density. So occupant density is going to drive the amount of airflow, the amount of ventilation CFM you need, and humidity levels are going to, you know, kind of push you towards the DOAS as well. The number one market nationally for dedicated outside air systems is schools uh, because of the high occupant density. Um, however, let's take a school in Atlanta, Georgia, and compare it to a school in Los Angeles. Now, they both will have similar occupant densities, so we've got high ventilation rates, which is one, one determiner, determining factor to push us towards a DOAS, but only the one in Atlanta has the humidity levels. So in Los Angeles, you might use an ERV for that application, whereas in Atlanta, you're definitely going to need a dedicated outside air system because you need to get that air below the dew point to get the moisture out of it and then reheat it back to room neutral 70 degrees and introduce it to the space as uh, fresh, clean ventilation. Now, going back to the Los Angeles example, all you really need to do is bring it from 86 degrees or whatever your design temperature is down to 70. You don't have to dip it below the dew point because it didn't have humidity in the airstream to begin with. So it's, it's um, occupancy class uh, classification is, is a huge de determining factor because that uh, determines your occupant density, but then also humid or not humid is another uh, major driving factor. Great. Next question. When the building is under positive pressure and the relic damper, damper or the power vent is open, is there any formula to calculate the CFM exhausting out? That sounds like a very technical question that I'll let Joe answer. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, you would have to look at your design and um, it depends how your building's being controlled. If you're controlling off of uh, a building um, static pressure sensor, that sort of thing. Uh, so typically what you'll do is you'll design for a specific value like um, positive pressure by 0.1 inches of water gauge or something of that nature. So building neutral is ideal, but because you know, pressure neutral is ideal, but because it's so difficult to get it exactly pressure neutral and you really don't want negative where you're sucking contaminants into your building, uh, uh, design professionals typically err on the side of slightly pressurized. And there's various ways of ensuring that. In fact, there's actually um, most dedicated outside air systems have VFDs on both the um, supply and exhaust fan if applicable. And you can control these based upon um, pressure settings. So your control point is typically your measured pressure within the building. However, you can convert that to CFM based upon uh, various things like uh, you probably, you may even have to do field measurements of the face velocity exiting, um, you know, exiting your building. What's the best way to measure energy used by a DOAS or ERV? Yeah, I mean, I, I know certainly certainly some of that uh, is is measured in different ways, but you know some of that depends on state and state and local laws that are in place at the time. I know certain states like Washington recently passed uh, new laws that kind of govern the energy energy usage of, of those. Uh, Joe, I'm not sure if in your experience you have any uh, additional information on those. Yeah, I'm not sure if the question is asking if you wanted to determine the energy consumption of the ERV or DOAS alone in the absence of all the other things in the building. Um, if that is the question, there is various, uh, you know, monitoring components that can be installed on systems. Uh, the harder part is to measure the output, the amount of BTUs created. Um, so it's pretty easy to measure the energy in, but typically if you're measuring the energy in, you also want to know how many BTUs you made with that energy in. So for example, you can have a set of CTs um, current transducers on the incoming power to the ERV or DOAS and have that connected to a watt hour meter and that together will measure your KWH usage over time for those two respective pieces of equipment. The harder thing to do though is to measure for that energy in how many BTUs you got out. Now for something like a water system it's pretty easy. You put temperature sensors and and flow um, you know uh, a flow meter in the water stream 
and boom, you've got an easy formula and you've got your BTUs that you're, you're moving. Um, with air, it's a little more difficult to, to really capture uh, the BTUs that, that you're uh, passing through that system. So that, again, to recap, the measuring the energy in is relatively simple and inexpensive, but um, confirming the BTUs you got out of that energy in is a little bit more complicated. It can be done, it's just, um, it's difficult outside of a laboratory setting. In the field, it's more challenging. Gotcha. Okay, so next question. Doesn't a decoupled system cause stratification in the space if DOAS and FC, I presume that means fan coil, are discharging different temperatures? Yeah, I know. I, I know. I recall Joe from your earlier comments. I believe you said uh, you know you kind of you kind of prefer the the decoupled system, but I'll, I'll let you add any additional comments on that. It's absolutely a concern, and I would probably consider it a design parameter. So things you're going to want to look into is what kind of velocity are you exhausting out of your GRD, your grills, registers, and diffusers, and given the appropriate location of your respective grills and the velocities that you're, you're supplying at, um, that can improve um, air mixing and reduce stratification. A poorly laid out building, yes, that would be very much a concern, and then a coupled system. So if you're concerned about that layout or don't have expertise in, in reducing stratification, then a coupled system may be the easier way to go. Well, you know, that kind of matches the, the next question, which is about coupled systems. In a coupled system, how are the DOAS and VRF fan coils synced? Um, in parentheses, it says airflow mod modulation on, on and off during operation. Yeah, the easiest way is to have them at the same fan speed. So in other words, if the VRF fan coil has high, medium, and low, and the dedicated outside air system is a plenum fan on a VFD, continuously variable, the best thing to do is to balance it at your ASHRAE 62.1 ventilation rate and whatever fan speed you've got the VFD set to on the supply fan in the DOAS and whatever fan speed you had the VRF fan coils on to achieve your required ventilation rates in each space served by that DOAS, you can leave it there, set it, and forget it. Now, if you want to take advantage of the variable speed nature of the DOAS and the um, VRF fan coil, this is where I was explaining that it's difficult to do. It can be done, but it's just much more of a challenge for the design professional, which is why I really personally favor decoupled systems because they're just easier to design and implement. Um, but it can be done. And usually the recommendation that I give is that at your minimum VFD speed, so a plenum fan, which is uh, typically used in, in most of your uh, manufacturer's DOAS systems, it can go 50 to 100% modulation. Below 50%, the fan curve for a plenum fan is, isn't pretty, and so the performance, you, you typically wouldn't modulate lower than that. And then in VRF fan coils, they typically only modulate about 75 to 100% of their nominal airflow. So what you would do is at the lowest position on the supply fan in the DOAS and the lowest fan speed in the VRF fan coil, that you would ensure that at that setting, you're meeting your ASHRAE 62.1 minimum ventilation rates, and then anything above that, you'll know that you're going to meet or exceed those rates for your building. Okay, great. Now I'm going to skip this question and go back to it because there's a related question to what you just said. So code is shifting from efficiency to effectiveness, which is great. But how do you integrate energy recovery requirements? Yeah, I assume that question goes back to, to talking about the ASHRAE codes and some of the other ones that, that we talked about earlier. Um, and I, I know Joe mentioned earlier that some new, I think some new codes just came out uh, uh, last week, I believe. So I'll, I'll let you take that one. Andy, can you repeat that one more time? It sounded like there was two different questions in there. I heard the effectiveness side of it. What was the other part? Yeah. Um, so the person seems to be asking about how the code is shifting from well, the person saying from shifting from just efficiency to effectiveness, which I presume means you know keeping the out the, the outdoor air uh, clean and um, maintaining IAQ. So, and they say that's great, but they're wondering how do do you, they how do we deal with um, integrating energy recovery requirements, which I perhaps means energy efficiency in the, in this case, um, with the um, with the ventilation requirements, the IAQ requirements. 
That's my interpretation. Okay, I'm, <laughs> Tell me. Yeah, I'm answer. not sure. Yeah, I'm not totally certain I understand the intent of the question, but in terms of effectiveness, when we're talking about delivering ventilation air to the space, my understanding of that per ASHRAE 62.1 is the manner in which you deliver it. So in other words, if you have ventilation air going directly to the occupied space, you have good effectiveness. They even look at if it's being supplied at a low level or a high level, you know, from the ceiling or from the floor. And then you look at things like, well, what is the penalty in terms of effectiveness if you pressurize ventilation into a plenum space, hallway, or corridor, and then it's pressurized in those spaces, which forces the ventilation to trickle into the occupied space. They give you penalty factors that discount. So in other words, if, if ASHRAE 62.1 calculation gives you 1,000 CFM of ventilation, you might require an extra 200, 20% extra ventilation because you're, you're taking a penalty on effectiveness because you're not delivering it directly to the occupied space, but rather to some proxy that will then filter into the space, such as a hallway, plenum, corridor, um, et cetera. Um, the other half of that question sounded like it had to do with ERV and ERV effectiveness. Uh, for the most part, ERVs are a good idea, provided you have room in the space for both supply and exhaust ductwork. So in order to do any kind of energy recovery, you need two, you need two pathways one in and one out. Code, uh, by and large, is moving towards requiring energy recovery for smaller and smaller and smaller CFMs. So I said approximately 60% of the DOAS market right now includes some form of energy recovery. I wouldn't be surprised in another six, eight, 10 years that that's 75, 80% of the market, um, just because it's, it's a no-brainer. If you look at the um, cost impact or the, the ROI, of specifying a DOAS with or without ERV, the payback for that additional cost is about six months or less uh, for most system types. Um, and then within ERVs themselves, if the question was about effectiveness of the heat transfer, generally speaking, a the sensible effectiveness, whether it's a core or an energy wheel, is about 70%, and the latent effectiveness is about 60%. Now, there are products out there that go up well above this and well below this, but the ASHRAE minimum requirement is at least 50% effectiveness of uh, energy recovery at design. Okay, great. Next question. What are the pros and cons between packaged rooftop DOAS and split DX DOAS? Yeah, I, I, I know this. Go ahead, go ahead, Joe. Sorry, James. Yeah, I would probably say that it's job specific or project specific. A lot of times we've used split system DOAS um, to get us higher efficiency. Some of the split system DOAS offerings include a, a condenser coil that's much larger than the equivalent tonnage condenser coil on a package unit. Another reason might be that you need to take advantage of long line lengths. In other words, your, let's say for example, your existing roof structure cannot accommodate a packaged DOAS system or else you'd have to upgrade the structural. Maybe it's an end-of-life old rooftop unit that's being replaced. Well, the new one is going to be larger and heavier because in order to be more efficient, it's probably going to be larger and heavier and have larger coils. So you might move from a package to a split design so that you don't have to upgrade the structural materials on your roof but still meet code and, and meet or exceed the efficiency requirements for that. Um, so there's several different reasons pushing you one way or the other. Uh, another reason might be that you want a heat pump DOAS and that your package manufacturers or package DOAS suppliers only offer gas furnace or all electric, but not a heat pump option. So it really comes down to the customer's needs and the type of building and, and job specific details of that nature. Okay. Next question. Are there any special precautions you have to take in the winter or in really cold climates with uh, DOAS or any of these? other uh, ventilation systems? Yeah, I, I certainly I certainly know that we've, we've installed, uh, you know, across many different applications and, and throughout all different areas of the country. I mean, Joe used the example of the school in Atlanta versus the school in, in Los Angeles and the differences between those, but I'll, I'll let him uh, give further detail on that. Yeah, for the most part, the limiting factor in an ERV or a DOAS is the energy recovery device. So, for example, Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi's brand of ERVs 
we require some form of preheat if you're going to be entering that um, heat recovery core with less than 14 degree Fahrenheit air in the winter. And so that's just to prevent frosting. What happens is if, if it goes below that value, the supply fan will actually operate intermittently rather than continuously in the ERV, which is not you know, desirable in most applications. And so sometimes preheat has to be added to make sure that we don't um, destroy the core and or have intermittent ventilation. Similarly, similarly on dedicated outside air systems that have you know, an energy wheel built into them, usually the spec is if you've got a design temperature down to zero degrees, you add a wheel control method known as modulating wheel. What it will do is it will slow the wheel and you'll get less efficient heat transfer the colder it gets out. But what you're really trying to do is not ice up the wheel by slowing its rotation. If you're say negative 10, negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit is your design condition, you'll actually put a preheat on a dedicated outside air system that has an energy wheel um, for the same reason that, that you would have preheat on a core. Um, with regards to performance, um, typically you're, when you're treating ventilation, you're trying to make 70 degree, 50% RH air. And so in the summer, when it's hot above 55, say, you're in cooling. And when it's below 55, you're in heating. So you don't typically have to worry about the mechanical cooling and heating being out of range. Uh, they're typically just fine. Unless, of course, we consider a heat pump variety of a dedicated outside air system where the primary heat source is also DX, then in that case, there may be um, auxiliary, redundant auxiliary heat for any of the run hours that are beyond the uh, operating range. Okay, great. Uh, given the time, this might be our last question, so let's see how it goes. So if you have, oh, let's see, make sure I'm re reading this correctly. All right. So. What kind of duct work is used with uh, with DOAS systems if you have a, a ducted VRF system? What is what is the duct work like? What and what special precautions do you have to make? Yeah, certainly. I'll I'll start with a little bit with the VRF portion. I'll let Joe uh, talk about the the DOAS systems. But obviously, with VRF, you can have uh, uh, refrigerant piping that's run, and they can be ducted or ductless. Uh, I think the question was specifically around uh, uh, ducted uh, and how that relates to, to DOAS. So I, I'll let Joe speak to how that ties into the VRF system. The big takeaway for ventilation ductwork versus, you know, space air conditioning ductwork is the size. Um, you're gonna have much smaller ductwork for the equivalent tonnage of ventilation air because you're doing um, a lot less CFM per ton. So a DOAS without an energy wheel is doing 120 to 160 CFM per ton. Uh, with a wheel, it might be doing um, 200, 225, 250 CFM per ton or so, something in that ballpark, 150 to 250. It really, it really ranges based upon uh, your market, your climate, et cetera. But anyways, that compared to 400 CFM per ton for a standard rooftop unit design, it equals a lot smaller ductwork. And so depending on the amount of airflow you're moving, you're gonna use your standard um, sizing principles for ductwork sizing as you would with standard conventional, you know, um, rooftop uh, ductwork, except for, again, we're gonna be processing a lot lower CFM. As always, you would want insulated ductwork just as you would with a standard rooftop design. So nothing much changes there. Really the short answer is that the ductwork is gonna be smaller diameter. Great, thank you. And I think that's the, the last question we have time for. All right, thanks, thanks Andy, I appreciate that. Thank you for the Q&A portion of the uh, the webinar, and I, I think now we'll turn it back over to, uh, to Bob. Thank you to everyone for attending this webinar. And thank you to both James and Joe for taking the time to present this topic and to Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US for sponsoring this webinar. For those of you who'd like to view this presentation at a later date, you can do so in the next few days in the members only section of rses.org, which I can show you how to get to right now.
There we go. To view this webinar, uh, as well as the previous webinars, uh, log in at rses.org by entering your username and password in the upper right-hand corner right here. Once you log in, there we go. You go to my RSES homepage right under where you logged in. Click on that. Then go over to the left to the webinars tab. And if you scroll down, you'll see that we have uh, two terrific uh, upcoming technical webinars. One from our past president, Joe Marchese, on servicing refrigeration systems, and one from our friend Brian Orr on proper evacuation techniques. And then if you scroll down even farther, this is where the uh, today's webinar will be uh, will be housed. And uh, you can see all the other archive webinars that we have, uh, one of the many benefits of your RSES membership. Uh, also, today's webinar's attendees live event will receive a certificate for completing one hour of continuing education. And that will arrive in about an hour after this event ends. That will come in your email, uh, so keep an eye out for it. And then if you have any questions, you can email me at webinars at rses.org. Uh, again, that's webinars at rses.org. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day. And this webinar is now concluded.